Our trio of lectures on reading the Bible with the early church begins this evening with riches from the Syriac church. And one of its most eloquent and original voices, Ephraim the Syrian of the fourth century, known as the harp of the Holy Spirit, probably the most highly respected of the Syriac poet theologians. Our speaker, Dr. Jean-Nicole Mellon Saint Laurent, is a scholar of Syriac studies and of early Christianity with special interests in hagiography hegi and sacred narratives. She studied with the top Syriac scholars in the world, Sebastian Brock at Oxford University, who sends his warm greetings to me <laughs> and wishes he could be here, and Susan Ashbrook Harvey of Brown University, where our speaker earned her PhD in 2009. Let it be noted that Dr. Saint Laurent began her academic career here. In 2000, <laughs> she graduated summa cum laude in religious studies and classics from Gonzaga University. And her husband is also a graduate, and he is here tonight as well. <laughs> Since earning the doctorate, she has held several research awards, including two from Dumbarton Oaks, and in 2012, an award for summer study in Arabic in Fez, Morocco. Dr. Saint Laurent is author of Missionary Stories and the Formation of the Syriac Churches, published last year by Berkeley, the University of California Press. There's a display copy, please don't take it, <laughs> and flyers for ordering it with a 30% discount. The display copy is so you can look through and sample table of contents, etc. She's the co-editor of a digital database published in 2016 in two parts, The Gateway to the Syriac Saints and Lives of the Syriac Saints. She's currently producing for Gorgias Press a translation of the history of Mar Benham and Sarah, Mar Benham being a fifth century Syriac martyr and Sarah his sister. Dr. Saint Laurent is also translating two poems on Christology by Jacob of Serug, the eminent fifth century Syriac poet theologian whereas his predecessor, Ephraim, is known as the harp of the spirit, Jacob is known as the flute of the spirit. The poems Dr. Saint Laurent is translating will appear in the volume on Christ in the forthcoming Cambridge edition of Early Christian Writings. She's also beginning a project entitled Enslaved Saints concerning hagiography and slavery in late antiquity. Her topic tonight is Mary in the Syriac tradition. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Saint Laurent. Well, thank you so much. I just cannot tell you how honored I am to be here tonight back at Gonzaga. Um, this is a school that is truly my alma mater. I, I love the people here. My teachers here were so important. Uh, Father Schlatter of Blessed Memory, who taught me Latin and Greek, and Father Ken Kral, my Latin teacher, and Dr. Kugler, my Hebrew teacher, Dr. Tkach, my Latin teacher, both Tkachs, and indeed Father Harton. I had him in New Testament my sophomore year, which was 20 years ago, so I'm really feeling my age, but here we are, um, and it is, with, it is just a joy uh, to speak about one of my favorite topics. Um, of course, Syriac theology is um, my deep love, um, and uh, the Syrians, as I've discovered in my work, have a lot to teach us about our Blessed Mother. And they have a beautiful portrait and a very rich um, theology of her, very rich Mariology. So um, I invite you just to uh, take a trip with me to the Middle East, uh, to a Semitic world, to the world of our Lord, uh, to the world where stories are told and poetry is spoken. And that is how you learn about God, is in this language of poetry in hymnography and metaphor. Uh, and Mary is at the heart of it. Um, and I, I will be also showing you some, uh, some images throughout the night. Feel free, by the way, if you have questions, to, to um, uh, make note of that. And there will be questions at the end of our talk. I'm happy to talk about uh, address anything, and I'll try not to go too fast. I'm used to um, undergrads who don't have 
always the longest attention span. So it's wonderful just to be here and know that you're actually paying attention. You're not going to ask me what's going to be on the test at the end, et cetera. So anyhow. thank you for coming. I know there's a lot of exciting things that could, one could be doing. But uh, let me have to make sure now I can get my technical. Let's see. There we go. There she is. Uh, this is a modern icon, actually, of Mary and Christ. Um, and the, uh, the script above is um, Syriac. It's, uh, <laughs> you get to learn several alphabets when you learn Syriac. It's one language with three different alphabets. Um, that says, Betulfo Mariam Yoldath Aloho, and Moran Aloho Yeshua Meshiho, below. So that's the Virgin Mary the God-bearer, the Yoldoth Aloho. It's the equivalent of Theotokos, or God-bearer, her title in the Greek tradition. Uh, Moron, our Lord uh, and God. Moron, Alohan, Yesh Yeshua, Jesus, Meshiho, the Christ. So um, there they are together. Um, and Ephraim, as, as Dr. Takach said, is the greatest of the Syriac theologians. Um, and he has a very high, rich, developed tradition about Mary at a very early date. He lives in the fourth century. He is born about 320 and dies around 370. So he's, in, he's sort of in the heart of the patristic era, in the heart of the fourth century, a close contemporary of the Cappadocian fathers in the east and Augustine farther west. Um, and he has a large uh, cycle of hymns on the nativity and it is there that of course we're going to find a lot of exciting things about mary so and this is all very early so i'll start off with a quotation from his 17th hymn on the nativity and what you'll see is that he's going to take um, the opportunity to imagine what mary thought and what was she thinking as she found out that she was going to bear the Christ. And he gives her words. He imagines that she sings a lullaby to her child. And she's singing of the mystery of the incarnation. She says, the tiny child whom I carry himself carried me. He lowered his wings and took me and placed me between his pinions. He soared into the heavens and promised me both height and depth shall be your son. That's a quotation referring to Luke. Ephraim continues his song, contrasting then Mary with Eve. That will be a theme throughout that we'll be talking about. Mary and Eve are the two great women in the Bible for Ephraim, and they're so important for different reasons, and they cannot, and for Ephraim, who sees scripture as a unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you cannot understand Mary unless you understand Eve. And so you'll see this typology, um, this sim symbolism of the two women throughout his theology. And in, and in this particular hymn, he contrasts two different robes. In Genesis, in the Genesis story, when our mother Eve got tricked by the serpent and disobeys, and eats from the tree that was forbidden, to, uh, that, that they shouldn't have eaten from, she and Adam are forced out of Eden, and they become aware of their nakedness, and they put, them, they put on leaves, and the Syrians call these leaves of shame, garments of shame, that what they lose in paradise after, dis, after disobeying God are garments of shame. Now Ephraim then will look then to the new Eve, who's Mary, the new Eve, who will use her free will in an exactly opposite way. And her yes will bring in Christ and will bring in hope for the world. So she, instead of putting on the robes of the garments of shame, the garments of leaves, she puts on a robe of glory. And so he sings of this. He contrasts the robe of glory that Mary puts on when she says yes to God's invitation. And he says, in her virginity, Eve put on leaves of shame, but your mother, Christ, in her virginity, has put on a robe of glory, encompassing all, while to him who covers all, she gives a tiny body, that is to Christ, a tiny body, a little garment. 
So Ephraim is praising Mary and establishes in his theology her as a great role model for all people. God transforms Mary into being a perfect temple to carry the Son of God. So when she says yes to, the, to Gabriel, when she says, yes, I will carry the Messiah, her body is transformed for Ephraim into a temple. So you have this beautiful imagery that he says. He says, God transforms her into a temple. And so Ephraim says, blessed is she in whose heart and mind Christ is. Mary is a royal palace. So you'll see throughout these, as I quote these, these, uh, po these poems and these hymns of Ephraim, so many titles for Mary, not just God bearer, but she's also a royal palace. So here he's talking about how she's been created to be a temple for Christ. Because of you, O royal son, she is a sanctuary for you, the high priest. And so we see just, before, just as we get going then, the elevated place that Ephraim has for Mary in, in, his, in the Syriac tradition. And as I said at the beginning, her title is Yoldoth Aloho. Can you say that? Yoldoth Aloho, bearer of God. That's, that's, and so when you go to Syria now, you can ask your, the people whom you meet, the Christians and so on, and say, what do you think of the Yoldoth Aloho? And they'll say, wow, isn't that great? You know something about our tradition. Uh, that is, as I said, the Syriac translation of Theotokos which Mary receives, for those of you who need to brush up on your church history, Mary will be uh, uh, defined as the God-bearer at the Council of Ephesus in 431. Um, so Ephraim, who's living 100 years before, as we see, is anticipating something that the later church will finally say is for sure. So the Syrians have, from the beginning, a very high place for Mary, more than in other parts of the early Christian world. Um, so when, when uh, uh, 100 years before the Council of Ephesus, Christians living east of Ephesus, east of the Euphrates River, in the Syriac-speaking world, identify Mary's theological importance. Why? Because it is, through, it is through Mary, it is through her, that Christ's humanity is truly affirmed. She is human. Yes, she carries the incarnate God, but she herself is human, and that is very important. And I often tell my students, for the ancient mind, to believe that Christ was divine was easier for them to understand because they lived in the Greco-Roman world in which people were accustomed to thinking that a god could come down in the form of a person. The Roman gods did it all the time. So the more... A uh, shocking thing for, for, for a Christian then to say was that Christ was really human. And so that's so important. That's why Mary is so important, because it is through Mary that, that his humanity is affirmed. Born of a human mother. Yes, the incarnate word of God, but born of a human mother. And it is she whom God chose to prepare to carry his son. Um, so... Mary, then, is at the center of the most important paradox and mystery and truth of the Christian faith, which is that of the Incarnation. Incarnation, that God became a man, a person, a human being, truly, at the moment of the Incarnation. And where did it happen? And you, we're going to talk about this later as we go through some of her hymns. In the womb of a small woman in Bethlehem, a small, unimportant, not a, not a queen, not someone with a lot of power, but a poor girl, not even married, or she was sort of betrothed, the most unlikely candidate. And that for Ephraim is something to celebrate. So he sees in Christian theology, in the Bible, in scripture, so many beautiful paradoxes, which are true. And we accept them as part of our faith. And so how do you deal with the paradox? You know this is true. It must be true. Your faith guides you. Well, you have to approach it for Ephraim with wonder. So he'll talk about that as well. That the true, the best posture for approaching our faith 
is wonder. Sidney Griffith, a great Syriac scholar, has talked about Ephraim's approach to scripture could be called faith adoring a mystery. And so we look to the scripture to understand, but it's always with the perspective of faith and adoration and in love and in wonder. And I'm a mother now. I have a 15-month-old son who is being taken care of by our wonderful, um, my in-laws right now. And I understand wonder now in a different way because I see what that means through looking at him. Children have it, don't they? They know to see the world through wonder. And so that is what we can learn from our children, but also from Ephraim. So his theology of wonder. And so Mary is also at the heart of this. So before then, so she, so in, in Syriac, the word for word, the word for word, um, the equivalent of logos in Greek is meltho. Um, and so they say that the, the incarnation is the moment when the divine meltho is enfleshed. And in Syriac, you say, lavash pagro, he put on a body. It's the language of clothing. He clothed himself in the garment of humanity. And Ephraim proclaims, for this is again, remember, this is Christmas time. Today, a child was born, and he, that is Christ, is called a wonder. That's qu uh, quoting Isaiah. For it is indeed a wonder that God reveals himself, how? As an infant, a little baby. It is a wonder that God reveals himself as an infant. So now that we've sort of gotten a, a bit of taste of where we're headed, let's back up a little bit now. And I want to teach you or share a little bit about Syriac um, in the broader sense. What is this language? Who are the people that spoke it? And how is it significant as part of our um, heritage? How is it something that we are a part of? Well, this is a um, manuscript. You always feel really smart when you put up manuscripts in your PowerPoint. You know, that's when you know that you can really gain some authority, right? Um, this is, so this is a chance for you to see, uh, this is a, actually from a monastery in Lebanon, the, of, um, in Baladot, I believe, an Antiochian Orthodox monastery. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually a prayer book. This is a prayer book. Um, it's, a, it's a dialect of Eastern Aramaic. So Aramaic was a language spoken in the Middle East um, beginning in the 11th century before Christ. And it was a very uh, important um, language. And Syriac was a particular dialect spoken around the city of Edessa. I'm going to show you some maps in a moment to help you um, get situated. So it's an Eastern Aramaic dialect. And that's what another script looks like. So now you've already seen two different scripts. This is two different, another alphabet. Uh, the red is um, when it's quoting scripture. Okay, boom, there we go. Here's a nice map. So where was it spoken? So Syriac was spoken in uh, the areas which correspond roughly to what is today uh, Syria, obviously, also Iraq, um, Southeast Turkey. Um, you can see here on the map, um, Lebanon um, over here, uh, but up there, if you see, I uh, um, wish I had a pointer. This is hard being short sometimes. And up there, uh, uh, Iraq. Um, and then in the middle of, of the map, is this, there's a city, Tur Abdin. That's the center. Um, it was the center of the Syriac-speaking world. It still is a very important uh, center of the Syriac-speaking world. Mesopotamia. Um, and in late antiquity, Syriac was a very important Christian language. It comes into its own as a, as a literary language by the third century. Um, and it's, as I said, it's the particular dialect of Aramaic spoken around the city of, of Edessa, which is uh, today called Orpha. You can see it up on the map over there, right above Osirene was the Roman province, just north of that, and then you go to Haran and then Edessa. So, so you can see. Um, and the texts in Syriac comprise the third largest surviving corpus of literature after Greek and Latin from the late antique period. So it's a large, large um, corpus of literature. This is, by the way, kind of why I was interested in Syriac, because I discovered there was so much work to be done. Lots of things had, have still not even been edited, so there's still a wonderful um, opportunity uh, for, for, for new work to be done. Um, with all due respect to my colleagues in the Latin and Greek 
<laughs> worlds. <laughs> Uh, it flourishes as a literary language, not only, however, in the Roman Empire, but also outside in the Persian Empire, the Sasanian Empire, um, what is, and even farther east. So just, just when you think you've seen it all, I'm going to show you something really special in a minute. But you just got to hang on a little bit longer. Um, it was Syriac becomes a lingua franca. Uh, enabling commerce and religious missionary activity across political boundaries. And indeed, it is very close to the language spoken by Jesus himself. So Christ would have spoken Palestinian Aramaic, a dialect of, of another dialect of Aramaic spoken in the Holy Land. Um, and the Syriac Christians today, the churches of the Syriac tradition, are very fond of telling you that, that they speak the language of Jesus. And I have to say that studying uh, Syriac as an adult when I began this uh, many years ago now um, has enriched my faith, I think, not only, it, not, it, very much so because I think it's helped me understand Jesus more. The way that, that Jesus teaches in the Gospels when he's telling stories and when he's telling parables, that's exactly how for him, for instance, someone like Ephraim speaks and teaches. So it's, 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 very, it's been very enriching for me on that level as well. Some of the churches today uh, of the Syriac tradition include the Church of the East. They're also called the Assyrians. Um, they flourish in, in Iraq outside the Roman Empire and the Sassanian Empire. The Chaldean Catholics, the Syrian Catholics, the Syrian Orthodox. There's the Indian Orthodox. So they go all the way to India. Um, the Maronites, I'm going to probably inevitably leave someone out, um, but there are, there are almost 15 different churches connected to the Syriac tradition throughout uh, the Middle East and India. And varieties of Neo-Aramaic are spoken in Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and the diaspora, so largely Muslim countries today. I want to show you real quick before we end with the slides, um, one, a, a quick glance at the project, just so you have a sense at how big this field is, because I, I was extremely excited to learn this as I've gotten into it. My colleagues and I, um, the last couple years, have been involved in, let's see if this is going to work now, a project, and then expand, no, darn it. But darn it didn't get on the recording. <laughs> okay. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, this is the database that my colleagues and I have uh, created called syriaca.org, in case you're interested. Um, it's a digital humanities project to make available places, persons, uh, saints, authors, hagiography, hey, and there's several, there's a couple other modules, including manuscripts um, of the tradition. And it's all free. We did this with the project, uh, through, with the grant from the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment of the Humanities. Um, it's all free, and um, it contains a large um, database of, of information. So, for instance, here, let's see if the example record, so here you can see where Edessa is, that just popped up. Um, and you can scroll in. So for those of you who are teachers, you might enjoy showing this to your students because of course it's, it's a way uh, to visualize things which are otherwise sometimes hard to, to picture. So you can see the Euphrates River there flowing. Just wanted to show you. And then also um, here, back here, this has been my part of the, port of the project have, has been putting the saints modules together. There are thousands of saints in the Syriac tradition, believe it or not, and you can search for them all right here. Kadishe is the word for saints in Syriac, so that's the name of the, the catalog that I've put together with my colleagues. But just to show you, and then here, in the tradition, one last thing I have to share is, this is the Bibliotheca Hagiographica Syriaca Electronica. Um, I inherited, I know, right, <laughs> the BHSE. I inherited a project from the Boland, a Bolandist uh, Jesuit in Belgium. The Bolandists, as some of you may know, are in charge of hagiography, hey all things having to do with saints' lives. He and his uh, colleague had put together a catalog of Syriac saints' um, and, and their, the text on their lives. And I digitized the whole thing and linked it all up. Um, so you can see, for instance, if you put in searching for text on Mary, just to show you how much is on Mary, or we'll do, it's in French, so we'll go Marie. Hopefully this works. You can see all these different um, stories. These are all homilies, just hundreds and hundreds. It goes on and on and on and on. 
Uh, so as I said, for those of you who are still students, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to tell you how to get involved in the field. There's, there's lots and lots of work to be done. Uh, many things that still haven't even been translated. So that is just a quick aside there. Let's see if I can get back now to my PowerPoint. Probably not, because these things are all there, I guess. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Mary. A little intervention, intercession. OK. All right. Now, uh, one last thing I do want to mention was that the Syrians actually traveled all the way. The Syrian church, um, which was centered uh, in the Persian Empire, the Church of the East, in the seventh century traveled all the way to China. They made it as far as um, Xi'an there, um, all the way uh, through, through all along the, um, the Silk Road, all the way to China. So there's evidence of Christian missionary activity and a lot of it, the inscriptions are in Syriac all throughout this world, which is something you perhaps um, may know. It's very interesting, and a, a lot of important work still needs to be done on that. And this is the most famous um, remnant of that missionary. Uh, has anyone ever seen this before? Some of you may have. This is, uh, this is a stella, um, a, a large um, grave uh, sort of... Um, uh, piece describing the coming of Christianity to China. Um, it was created in 781 in the Tang uh, Dynasty. It's in classical Chinese and Syriac. So of course, you've got to learn, you've got to, there's, a, there's only a few sort of scholars that can work on both, both these languages. They have a niche market. But anyway, this is very important. Um, this is a very important um, artifact. And it, it describes 150 years after it happened, the coming of uh, da King, it is called in Chinese, the coming of, of Christianity to China. So this, the Syrians were great missionaries, and they brought their form of Christianity farther east, long before Marco Polo and the Jesuits got to China. <laughs> this is, um, for those of you who like manuscripts, I wanted to show you then finally, the earliest dated manuscript that we have is actually a Syriac manuscript. It's dated to... Um, 411. It's in the British Library, um, BL 12150. It actually has a lot of hagiography, so it's a text, it's a manuscript that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and so, again, just, just more evidence of the importance of this, of this tradition for the study of the early church. And this, this manuscript also um, contains a long list of Persian martyrs, of all things. So... Um, the, the coming of the Syriac, uh, the, the coming of um, Christianity to the Syriac world in the language of the Syriac tradition is connected to a, a story about, I love this story, uh, the story um, concerns a man by the name of Abgar, a king, a legendary king of, of Edessa. You see, here he is, they've got wonderful hats. Um, that's, that's Abgar in the middle, and excellent shoes as well, with little tassels on them and so on. Abgar and his family, this is a, a, a mosaic from Edessa. And uh, the, the, the tradition was that Abgar suffered from gout. He had a problem in his foot. And he lived at the time of Jesus, according to the tradition. And so he had heard about a healer in Palestine who um, he thought, I'm going to invite this, this, uh, this Jesus to my city and have him heal my foot. So there was a tradition that Abgar had actually written a letter to Jesus. And Eusebius actually knows about this tradition in the ecclesiastical history. He talks about it. King Abgar wrote to Jesus and said, Jesus, please come, heal my foot. Uh, Edessa is a really nice place. I hear you're having a hard time in, the, in, in Palestine. People are giving you rough, etc. And why don't you come to Edessa? And Jesus writes back according to the tradition and says, I can't make it, but I'm going to send you my apostle Adai. So um, Abgar receives in place of Jesus the apostle Adai. So the Syriac tradition in Edessa uh, uh, links themselves to the apostle Adai. And Adai gains um, also a picture of Jesus. And this is what's shown here in this, um, in this uh, um, ivory 
um, carving from the from Turab Din from Southeast Turkey. And this tradition is actually also connected to the Mandelian tradition. So it's all very um, complicated, and I can't don't have time to get into that right now. But just to say, ways of authority was how the Syrians traced themselves back to Jesus. And it was also how they could say, see, we were actually Christian before even the rest of the empire. So long before Constantine legalized Christianity in 313, Abgar had, 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 you know, had, this, had this letter exchange, epistolary exchange with Jesus way back in the, the beginning of the common era. They wouldn't have called it that, but anyhow. So back to Ephraim then, now that you have a little bit of a sense of why I love this stuff. I mean, why would you want to study anything else? Syriac is so fun. There's so much interesting things, you know. Why would you want to study anything else? Um, here, I have some images here also to look at. This is a modern icon of Ephraim the Syrian. It uh, needs to be explained just a little bit. Um, he's dressed here in the garb of a, a Syrian Orthodox monk. Um, he wasn't a monk, however, and so it's very interesting. The later tradition turned him into that. He was a deacon. He was a deacon who worked for a bishop in the city of Nisibis, very close to Edessa, Bishop Jacob. And Ephraim uh, lived in a time in which, in the Syriac-speaking world, there were many different types of competing forms of Christianity, different, different Christian groups who had various views of who Jesus Christ was. And um, Ephraim was in the group that had accepted the Council of Nicaea, the, 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 the group that said that Jesus um, is, is the Son of God, he is truly God from God, light from lighter in Syriac, nuhro, uh, nuhro de nuhro, um, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, etc. as we know. But the Nicene Christians in his part of the world were actually a minority. So that's very interesting because if you see then, uh, the, the Orthodox Christology that, that he um, espoused and that, that, they, that he was connected to was a minority group. And that's why Mary then becomes so important, because she, again, is the person who will affirm uh, Mary, Jesus's humanity. This is the tomb of one of the bishops under whom Ephraim wrote his hymns. So Ephraim uses hymnography and poetry and homilies to teach theology, which is very um, impressive because I think teaching theology is wonderful, but if I had to sing it to my students every day, I'm not sure if I, I could do that. You know, it's an interesting challenge. But um, <clears throat> The Jesuit scholar, Father Robert Murray, who's a wonderful person and a wonderful scholar, a wonderful Syriacist, has called Ephraim the Syrian the greatest poet of the patristic age, and perhaps the only theologian poet to rank beside Dante. So he is truly the master, and he has a large corpus. Um, but for the Syrians, he is a teacher. Sidney Griffith has said that Ephraim's style of religious discourse is more contemplative rather than academic. It's a contemplative form of approaching the Bible. Um, based on a close reading of the Bible with an eye to understanding symbol. And the word for symbol in Syriac is a beautiful word. It's raza. Can you say raza? Raza. That's the word for symbol or type. It's the same. It's, it's what is type in Greek. So our wonderful colleague, Catherine Zakasha, says so much wonderful work on typology. This is the same word, same idea. These, it is through symbol, it is through type, it is through raza that God reveals God's revelation to, um, to the church. And this symbol, symbolic theology is so important for the Syrians. God has imprinted the world, in, imprinted creation and the Bible with signs of himself, and it's up to the theologian to uncover what that reality is. So, so for Ephraim, uh, it's, it's, it's very common to point out the ways in which his approach is very different from the Latins and the Greeks. Um, but I think this is the main thing we have to consider when we think about this, is that Ephraim doesn't like to, to go into a dangerous realm in which he thinks you might put God into your own words. Because for him, God is God, and God is a great mystery. And God has given us many things to explain who God is, if we really only understand how to look at it. 
there are two main important places that God teaches us. Ephraim says in creation, so he's really a wonderful environmental theologian. He looks at creation, the created world, as full of signs of who God is, and the Bible. And so those are his sources for, um, for theology, creation and the Bible. And so the Bible and nature and the natural world is also full of mysteries. And these mysteries themselves point to types about who God is and scripture as well. So it's, this, it's scripture, it's nature, and, and, um, and, and, uh, and the Bible. Those are his two places. Um, <clears throat> let me just keep watch, mindful of the time here. I know what it's like to be out there and that the time seems to go dragging by, but when you're up here, it's racing by, you know. I've only got a few more minutes and you're thinking, is she ever, I need to get home and go to bed, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to move, move on here and get back, to, get back to a little more of his... Theology. So this is uh, some pictures um, of Ephraim's world. So this is actually, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to the city of Nisibis, where he lived before he moved to Edessa. Ephraim, um, this is the Christian church of the city of Nisibis. It's called New Sidene today. It's a border uh, city between uh, Syria and Turkey, in southeast Turkey. In fact, you can see the Syrian border from across the way. And what's so fascinating is that Nisibis was actually a border city in the Roman Empire as well. It bordered the Persian and the Roman worlds. Uh, and this is a, a monastery, the monastery of Dar al-Zafran in southeast uh, Turkey, where Syriac is still spoken today. So if you want to go hear how they, how they speak so beautiful, you can go to southeast Turkey um, and, and visit these monasteries. This is his world. Um, he composed um, many, as I said, uh, he, many cycles of hymns and homilies. And we have to remember that in the ancient world, only 10% of the population could have read. So it was really in the liturgy that people learned their theology. And this is why it's really important to consider hymnography as a didactic tool. It was in the liturgy that the community was sealed together and the mysteries and truths of the Christian faith would be passed on. One of the wonderful things that Ephraim did was that he wrote specific hymns to be sung by women's choirs. He um, has a very strong model, strong, strong depictions and images of women in his theology. And um, in the city of, of Edessa, we've, we've learned, we've been able to piece this together. There were, uh, there were choirs of consecrated women who would, sing, um, who would sing in the liturgy, and he wrote specific hymns to be sung by the women antiphonally. And so it's really beautiful. You can imagine we've got this room set up like right down the middle. It'd be as if one half would sing one side and then the other half. And as we know through our studies in memory, when you sing things, it is a way of learning something. We can all probably still remember songs from our childhood um, better than maybe some of the things we learned in our in our college classes, right? So that's this idea that this is a way of teaching. Um, <clears throat> so in poetry for Ephraim is a marvelous genre for speaking about God. Why? Because poetry does not try to put um, definitions on things, right? It's a, it's a sort of, it's a realm of, that is more suggestive rather than definitive. It's the realm of metaphor. It's the realm of love. Well, God is love. Right? It's, the sort of, it's this idea that when a, when, a, when a mom holds her baby for the first time, she can't really tell anybody how much she loves that baby. She can only kind of say what that love is like. And that's how God is. Right? This, is this is the mystery of, of our faith. That the, the, the love of God that we have for God and that God has for us can never really be fully articulated. It's always a mystery. It's always beautiful. It's, poet, it's poetry, and so this is why um, you find in the Syrian such, a, such an attractive um, theology. Um, and he says, when the church sings her, he, these hymns, he says, in one of, another, another uh, cycle of hymns, the hymns on paradise, he says, the liturgy, the people singing, resembles for Ephraim heaven. So when we're at mass, we might say, when we're at liturgy worshiping God, we are imitating the life of the saints. We are participating in the blessed life. Um, and that's how the theology is then inscribed in our hearts. Um, Ephraim says, 
that we have to approach scripture with love and with wonder. And he says, and he, write, he writes, if you are a theologian, you will pray in truth. It, it, it's a rough translation of theologian. But if you pray in truth, you'll also be a theologian. So the two go together. One must always proceed with love and wonder. He says, whenever I have meditated upon you, he's praying now to God, I have acquired a veritable treasure from you. Whatever aspect of you, O oh God, I have contemplated, a stream has flowed from you. So you see the natural images, uh, treasures and streams. There's no way I can contain it. That's what he always says. There's no way the human language can contain the mystery of God. Your fountain, O oh Lord, is hidden from the person, however, who doesn't thirst for you. So you have to have the thirst within you for God. But once you have that thirst for God's love, then the fountain is available. And you can drink from that, as he says. So this, the wonder that we have for God will give birth to faith and praise. And this is, for Ephraim, the first prerequisite for theological inquiry. <clears throat> let, me, let me show you then a few pictures. Let's see, did I have the... We'll go back here. Oh, dear. Now I'm going to, uh, far ahead. Back. Oh, dear previous arrow. There we go. Okay. Um, Ephraim's Bible was a, was the Dia Tesseron. So he's, he's here. This is another modern icon and he's, and this is um, an Orthodox icon depicting the death, uh, the death of Ephraim, which is kind of a neat contrast. You can see the two different styles. Um, and Ephraim says that the, um, the one who approaches uh, scripture must be open for a variety of perspectives. He says many are, in his commentary on the Bible, he writes, many are the perspectives of God's word, just as many are the perspectives of those who study it. Isn't that a nice thing to say? Very welcoming. God, he says, has fashioned the world with many beautiful forms. Each one who studies it may consider what he, is, what he likes. Um, and he says, in his book, Moses described the creation of the natural world. Both nature and scripture bear witness to their creator. Nature through man's use of it and scripture through his reading of it. I'm, gonna, I'm mindful of the time, and so I'm going to move ahead because I want get, to get, get back to Mary, where we started, and speak a little bit then about the typology of Mary and Eve. This is so central then to Ephraim's ideas, as I said before. For Ephraim, the scripture here, this is a modern icon, obviously, a modern Western icon. I found this. I, I just thought it was beautiful. Look at how she's stomping on the, on the serpent. Isn't that great? You see the pregnant Mary stomping on that serpent's head and poor Eve. And this is, um, this is, this is a Western medieval, and I'll, I'll tell you a depiction of the Annunciation, and I'll explain why I selected that in a minute. It's very interesting. For Ephraim, the Bible is one single story. The Old Testament and the New Testament can only be understood through looking at the whole picture, as I said. Um, so Mary, as I said, is the second Eve. Ephraim affirms that Adam and Eve, once upon a time, were created with free will, like, a, like the gods. They had free will. And the difference was that they used their free will to disobey. Mary, on the other hand, will use her free will to obey God's command. So sin enters into the world through one man, or one, one woman, and one woman's disobedience, and redemption, or salvation, or restoration, or what the Syrians call healing, because for them that's what it's about. Salvation history is a, he is a restoration. That will come through the obedience of another woman. And they both imagine that it happens through, uh, through her ear. So, that, so it's through the Eve, Eve's um, ear that, that sin enters into the world when she listens to the serpent who tricks her. In the same way, through Mary's ear, um, the yes will come, which will undo that first, that first fall. Um, and so he says, just as from the small womb of, e of, of Eve's ear, death entered in. Now the womb is just 
um, a, a sort of round space. So that the, he's making an interesting point here. Death entered in and was poured out. So through a new ear, Mary's ear, life will be entered and life will be poured out. Um, and so Ephraim looks at the mystery of the incarnation and he wonders, what was Mary thinking? when this happened. And this is a, a fantastic thing about his theology too. He looks at scripture, he looks at a scriptural story and says, what was Mary thinking when the angel Gabriel popped in and says, you're going to carry the Lord, daughter. And, what was, and, and he says, what, what, was, what was she thinking? Eph, and, and Ephraim says, what indeed was the pure woman thinking at the moment when Gabriel was sent down to her? She saw him perhaps at the moment of prayer. So I think that's so beautiful. He imagines that Mary was praying when Gabriel came. So Mary becomes then also a model worshiper. She teaches us so many things. She saw him perhaps as a model of prayer. For Daniel was also at prayer when he saw Gabriel. For prayer is next of kin to good tidings. Um, and he also says that Gabriel was probably, probably looked like an old man because he didn't want to scare the young girl. All good tidings, he says, come to the harbor of petition, the greatest of all good tidings, the cause of all rejoicing, found Mary at prayer and eagerly desired her. Gabriel, inhabiting an honorable old man, entered and greeted her so that she wouldn't tremble, tr tremble so that the modest girl wouldn't see a youthful face and be sad. It's funny, right? There's a lot of humor in Ephraim, actually. I like to look for the funny moments. Well, I think it's funny. He may not have intended it to be that way. Um, Ephraim also sees Mary as a link to all the great people of the Old Testament. So he, he looks at the lineages in the Bible um, that are connected to Christ. And Mary is the link for Ephraim, through whom all believers, even the Gentiles, are linked to the righteous patriarchs, prophets, and saints. He says, Mary today has hidden in us the leaven of the house of Abraham. Let us therefore love the poor as Abraham loved the needy. Mary, like Solomon, will offer her son, the king, a diadem. Let his mother worship him, Ephraim says. Let her offer him a crown. For Solomon's mother made him a king and crowned him. So you'll start to see again, he's looking for ways in which Mary was prefigured in the Old Testament through other moments in, in the biblical narrative. Mary then, uh, this is, I'm going to share one of my other favorite hymns. In the hymn on the Nativity 16, Mary sings a song to her newborn child. And again, it's this language of wonder. It's so beautiful. What does she say to the baby Jesus? You are no ordinary human being. That's apparently what Ephra imagines. That he said, you're no ordinary human being to whom I should sing ordinary lullabies. Your conception was a new thing. Your birth, full of wonder. Without the spirit, who is able to sing of you? It's a new utterance of prophecy that stirs in me. So here Mary becomes a prophet. So you're seeing now she's become the new Eve. She's a prophet. She's an example. She teaches us. She's the perfect person. And she, so she's, she models so many things for Ephraim. And, he, and she says, how can I address you, baby? This is Mary speaking. Stranger to us, yet born of us, should I call you brother? Should it be betrothed? Or again, are you my Lord? Who gives to his mother a second birth that comes from the water? So that's, that's a reference to baptism, that Mary is also somehow his sister through baptism. I am your sister from the house of David. Who is your second father? Again, I am mother in view of your conception and betrothed as well because of your sanctity. Handmaid and daughter, by blood and water, you have both redeemed and baptized me. So you see all the mysteries entailed in the coming of Christ and Mary's role in all of that. Ephraim's not pinning anything down, but he's spinning around. He's spinning around through, through like cas a cascade of titles um, for Mary. And then Mary says, she teaches us then how to approach Christ through wonder. Um, Glory be to the voice that became a body. The lofty word of God became flesh. Mary bore a mute babe. Through him were hidden all our tongues. This is the hymn on the nativity. The lofty God became a little child. And hidden in him was a treasure of wisdom sufficing for all. 
The lofty one came and sucked from Mary's milk, yet from Christ all of creation has taken suck. So she's thinking about this. How is it that the all-powerful word of God who was present at the creation through whom all things were created, all of that power was incarnate into a little baby who now has to nurse from his mother to get his nutrition. How is this possible, this paradox of the incarnation? Again, Christ dwelt in his mother's womb, but in the womb of Christ, Ephraim says, dwells all of creation. So this beautiful language of paradox throughout the poetry. He was mute as a baby, yet Christ gave to creation all his commands. While the, while the fetus of the Son of God was being formed in the womb, he himself was forming babies in the womb as creator. All power dwelt in Mary's womb. She gave him milk. He gave, she gave him food, but from the things that he had created. He gave milk to Mary as God and was given suck to her as a human. So it's just this language back and forth between the contrasts of, of the incarnation. And then she talks about, um, there's, I, I can't, I would, could read all this stuff to you for the next hour and you'll be sleeping and I'll just still be talking and singing and, and so on. But um, she also has a beautiful ta a point where she talks about watching um, baby, the, the ruler of all crawling like a little baby. It's just beautiful. Cheerful among infants as a baby. I don't know about that. I'm thinking maybe Jesus cried sometimes. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, so now as, as the new Eve, Mary also takes away all the shame that women inherited from Eve's disobedience. So she sort of ushers in a whole new hope for the entire female sex. Eve looked for him, so Eve herself was hoping for the coming of Christ, for the shame of women was great, but he, Christ, would be able to clothe them, not in leaves, of sh of, of, um, not in leaves but rather the garments of glory that they had shed. Um, worthy of remembrance, Ephraim says, is the mother who gave birth to him. Worthy, too, of blessings is the bosom that bore him. Christ is, in the Syriac tradition, the divine physician, the oso ravo. He is the one who heals all. And so Ephraim says, Blessed is the physician who descends in and cut painlessly and heals sores with a mild medicine. His child was the medicine taking pity on sinners. Um, I'm going to um, jump ahead a little bit more, and, uh, so, and I know I've got to, end to uh, stop soon, so I will just say a few more words um, and close with a, a brief uh, address of some modern questions. Um, Ephraim in the Syriac tradition is the daughter of the poor. She is not the enthroned imperial princess that you see in, in sort of the, in the Byzantine tradition. She's the daughter of the poor. She's the one who was mocked and scorned for her pregnancy. He has a whole beautiful series about how Mary takes so all women who's, who's, who've ever been mocked, who've ever been ridiculed because of a problematic pregnancy, Mary stands behind them and witnesses for them and defends them. It's very beautiful. Um, she's the daughter of the poor. And Joseph, too, has a lot to say in Ephraim's hymns. Um, although he's silent in the Bible, it's very interesting. There's a lot of rich dialogue poems between the couples back and forth. Um, Joseph, the poor carpenter, will give birth, will, will, will raise, sorry, will, will be the father of, of the, the God who will be nailed to wood, Joseph the carpenter, Jesus nailed to the woods. A lot of typological language like that in the Syriac tradition. Joseph caressed the son as a baby. He served him as God. He rejoiced in him as a blessing and was attentive to him as a just one. What a great paradox. Joseph says in this, who has given me the son of the most high to be a son? I was jealous of your mother, Joseph says. I wanted to divorce her. I didn't know what was going on. He says, I didn't know in her womb was a great treasure which would enrich my poverty. So again, this image of Mary and Joseph being a very poor, humble people, it is them who, who God chooses then to, care, to be the family to raise 
uh, Therese the Messiah, a great paradox, not what, what the world would, would expect. Okay. And um, I wanted to then show you then um, a few other later images here expressive of the Syriac tradition. This is um, from 586. It's the, uh, the Rebula Gospels, actually in Florence. It's in the, um, it's in the, the library in Florence. Um, and they're beautiful um, illustrations, beautiful Syriac illustrated manuscripts from the monastery of Beth Zagba, which I thought was perfect because it's the Zags. You know, you see Beth Zagba. <laughs> I even italicized the Zag. So, <laughs> no extra charge. Um, these are some images of Mary from this manuscript. Here she's shown um, enthroned. You'll notice the peacocks, um, emblematic of, of paradise, also um, here. But this was the image that I particularly wanted to show you. This is um, here Mary with the apostles, figured at the ascension. And she's, he, she's shown here in the middle um, in purple. And what's interesting is that her form is so very feminine. It's very expressive of how Mary, being herself a mystery, although she was a virgin, you know, Ephraim has all these things about how she had, she had all the things of a virgin and a mother. And so you can see she's got a very feminine um, form here and her arms in prayer right in the middle. Um, and here are this image from Pentecost. Um, Suddenly, a handmaid has become the daughter of a king, by you, son of the king. Behold the lowly one in the house of David because of you. The daughter of the earth has reached heaven by the heavenly one. So Ephraim will, and the Syrians, elevate Mary herself to a thing of wonder. As a virgin mother, she is herself marvelous and mysterious. So we'll close then with one last hymn, and I promise this will be the last one. You're probably becoming like my students who think, she's going to talk forever. Oh, Lord, no one knows how to address your mother. If one calls her a virgin, her baby boy stands up and says, she's married, for, but nobody has known her sexually. Your mother, indeed, is incomprehensible. So who can hope to understand you? But she is your mother. She alone, she was a sister to you as well, with all chaste women. With you, Mary underwent all that Mary women undergo, conception, but without sexual intercourse, her breasts filled with milk, but against nature's pattern. You made her the thirsty earth all of a sudden into a fountain of milk. So again, all the paradoxes. Your mother is a cause for wonder, Tahro in Syriac. The Lord entered her but became silent. Your mother's womb has reversed all the roles. So it was in Mary's womb where everything changed. All the roles, all, all the, the establishments got overturned. The mighty one entered and put on insecurity from her womb. The giver of all entered and experienced hunger as he became a little boy. He who gives all drink experience thirst but babe in the womb so so she, he so he says um blessed is he then through whom all these things have have happened and this is um just want to say this and then i'll i'll take questions in a minute an image a recent image um I have to say that one of the reasons I got into Syriac studies was that I was extremely moved and excited about the Middle Eastern Christian tradition. Um, that was in 2002. And at that time, Syria was still a safe place to go. I had, would have had the opportunity to go and visit some of these places. Um, things were starting to get unsteady. Um, but now the danger is that this entire rich tradition is getting literally blown up. And the people are dispersed. The people are all over the place. If they haven't been killed, their families are torn apart. Um, their sites are destroyed. The monastery um, of Mar Behnam, to which uh, Dr. Takach referred to, um, where my colleague and I are translating a story from that tradition, it's now been destroyed. The ISIS blew it up in 2015. So this is a tradition. These are our sisters and brothers in the Middle East, 
their rich tradition is under tremendous threat. So we need to pray for them and do whatever we can to help. I don't know what that is. At least by making people aware that their tradition exists. Um, and in Sidnaya, uh, this is the, the, an icon from the monastery of Sidnaya, which is just north of Damascus. Sidnaya in Arabic means um, our, our, our Lady, so a monastery of Our Lady. There's a miraculous icon which has been venerated um, since the time of the early church, and that's shown here. A lot of wonderful miracles attached to this icon of the Virgin Mary. And you can see another picture here. It's another from the interior of, of, the, um, of the monastery. And what's so beautiful about Sadnaya is that it's venerated by Muslims and Christians alike. It is a place of wonder, and it's a holy, sacred place in Syria. This is the Yoldoth Aloho. You can see the multiple scripts above, including Greek um, and Arabic. Um, and it's such a, it, it, it embodies all that we really want for our world. Um, and, uh, and, and so we need, to, we need to ask the Virgin Mary for prayers. We need to ask her to continue to defend um, her, her people, and um, they, they do. But I, I guess I just, I, I struggled a little bit with knowing how to integrate this into my talk. Um, we just have to be mindful that this tradition, which I love and care so much about, is a living tradition. These are living churches with people um, with a strong and important sense of who they are, who have persisted um, through many wars and persecutions, um, and they link us to the past, and they link us to Christ. And so um, I guess I just am, am so grateful for the chance to get to share a little bit about that with you tonight. Um, and I know I've, I rushed through some of this material as well. I apologize for that. I had so many things that I wanted to say and didn't get to it all. But I'm very pleased um, to take any questions. And I don't know exactly what our time frame is, but. First, I want to thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes, please. So I think your last hymn kind of answers part of my question. Yes. Yes. But I, I wanted to ask if you also saw references to her immaculate conception. Um, the first, absolutely. The second's a little bit harder to know, but the um, the the virgin birth and Mary's virginity is a vital part of the story for Ephraim. Absolutely, it's part of her mystery. And her perpetual virginity after that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. As far as I can tell. Yes. Yes. Please. Sidnaya is being restored. I was at Sidnaya three years ago. Oh, you were? Then well, you can tell us more. I visited both Sidnaya and Maluna. Oh, wonderful. Both places. It was the, uh, Maluna was much more destroyed than, uh, than Sidnaya. Well, that's okay. Um, the nuns at Maluna were actually kidnapped by the same, by the same crowd. McCain's friends, the, the, the friendly, the friendly resistance. Um, they kidnapped, they kidnapped two of our bishops. Right. They're, they're still in captivity, probably in Turkey. Probably in Turkey. We're not really sure. Um, when I was at Sabnaya, you were not allowed to look at my mind. Oh, really? It was covered, yes. I remember, I was struck by your comment, that this is reverence about the Muslims as well. When I was at Malula, the mother abbess asked me to anoint the pilgrims with the miraculous oil from, from the shrine. It's another picture. I only found that afterwards. It had to be by anointing for Muslims. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, this is this where you went here? This image? Oh, yeah, Sidonia, yeah. Sidonia, yeah. I remember that very well. <coughs> yeah. Uh, this past, this past Christmas, President El Assad went back to Sinaia to meet with the nuns and the orphans. It, it's not very much well known in this country, but the, the Syrian government is protective of the Christians. That's why that government must not fall 
which is why the Orthodox Russia is over there right now, make sure it does not fall, mm -hmm. because it will be an absolute bloodbath to get that government close. But they were back at the at, at Saj and I, and I saw some uh, some films of that. But it, you don't you don't never find anything like that in American American television, American news. It's just they've got it all backwards by who's the good guy. But anyway, so now you think the story. That's wonderful to hear that. I'm, I'm envious that you got to go. I wish I'd love to go someday. Well, I want to go back, but uh, can't get my parish to agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Father. Thank you very much for your uh, very enthusiastic uh, presentation. It's wonderful to have someone who's so engaged in what you're studying, and I appreciate the way you, you presented it. I was also struck by your comments uh, about how Christians and Muslims venerate uh, the, 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 the icon. Because I think it's important to, to remember that you know, in the Quran, there's much more about Mary than there is in the Christian Bible, actually. Yes, uh, indeed. That's, that's something that we hold, we hold dear. I also thank you as well for your uh, reminder about uh, the persecution of uh, the, these uh, Christians there who really connect back to Jesus the tragedy of what is happening today whereby, you know, the, the connection with Jesus has ultimately been totally destroyed and how, you know, sadly the Western world turns a blind eye to it all and has done nothing to, to try to, um, you know, support the Christians there. And, uh, so I really appreciate it. The other thought I, I would like to also emphasize that I love about what you said is the emphasis on the hymns of, as a way of handing on the theology. You know, it makes it so alive to us to see how in the context of the liturgy, you know, the teaching is communicated through through hymns that people have, instead of the sort of uh, soppy hymns that we have in our church in a way, and singing <laughs> Michael Rowan Bobishaw or whatever. Like that. It's got no meaning to people at all, whereas the real theology is coming through. And, I yeah. and you answered the question, this is just on a personal level, I've uh, done some, some studies on the, the Acts of Thomas and that famous hymn of the pearl. Yes. There. And it, it, you, you opened up my eyes to you know the purpose of what that hymn is all about in that particular context. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. How well does Saint Ephraim know in the Middle Ages? Oh boy, his reception in the East or the West. Well, he was translated, it's a, that's a wonderful question. He was translated into Greek. Um, and so there's a large qu a corpus of Ephraim Grycus. It's all of Gre Ephraim's things uh, translated into Greek. He probably, if he would have, what he would have been known would have been therefore translated through the Byzantine tradition. Although a lot of um, what's in Greek uh, is, isn't actually by Ephraim, but it's attributed to him. It's an interesting point to St. Ambrose mentions my father, this is so funny, my father wrote his dissertation on St. Ambrose, the Latin father, and when I told him that I wanted to, to do Syriac, he said, well, you're never going to get a job doing that. <laughs> and then he said, I think that there's a Syrian, there's a Syrian that St. Ambrose talked about, because St. Ambrose also wrote hymns, as you know, and so it seems that St. Ambrose must, may have known about him too, perhaps also through the Greek tradition. Um, but as far as how Ephraim was known in the Latin West, I would have to say, I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, he wasn't really appreciated, this I can say, until the, 19th, until the 20th century. That was, he, was, he was sort of misunderstood, I think, because people didn't quite understand how to interpret his poetry in a theological context, and it was so different from, from the scholastic approach to understanding God, for instance. Um, and so it was through the work of, of Edmund, Edmund Beck, primarily, who, who uh, in, the, in the 40s um, took all of Ephraim and edited the critical editions. That's when he started to be rehabilitated. Um, but that's a, but it's, what's interesting, too, is that you start to see a lot of the distinctions that we like to draw as scholars between East and West and farther East and so on. You have to, we have to be careful 
because there's a lot, a lot of times much more intersection. I mean, what he's, when he's speaking about his approach to scripture, it sounds like Alexio Divina. It sounds like something very much that, that the Benedictines would, would appreciate, that you meditate on scripture and it's contemplative and you know, the repetition. And so, um, but that would be something very interesting to, to look into. I don't know off the top of my, my head, however. In the, in the East, of course, he was known. He was their great man. Yes, please, sister. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I can't off the top of my head. I, I have um, the, I do have the um, Hale, let me see if I have some of my books and I could read some to you. Or I could say the Our Father for you. How's that? Okay, <laughs> like that I could do. <laughs> so it's Abun de Bashmayo, Net Kadash Shmoch, Tite Melkutho, Nehwe Seviono, Aikano de Bashmayo, Of Barao, Hablan Lachmo de Sunkonan Yaomono, Washbuklan Haubain, Wachto Hain, Wafbuflan Haubain, Wachto Hain. Weolo te fason lenes you know, elo fason men bisho, metuldi lo hi melkutho, lo olam ol min, amin. So you already know amin, so you actually know Aramaic as well. <laughs> it's not as the same as singing it. However, I can show you brief, well, just since you asked, there's a beautiful, the Syrian Orthodox have been wonderful about putting many of their songs online, and if you, if you have a look here, for instance, uh, I'm looking for the internet here. Here comes the helper. Oh. Then this is nice, you can hear the.
there you have it. It's very beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful language. I appreciate that question. They say it better than I can. <laughs> yes, please. That move at the end, after this hymn and praise of Mary, to turn directly to praise of God and place Mary in relationship to him as clearly a subordinate, that's quite characteristic, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. She, she, show, she's point, she was like, points the way and orients, orients all believers in the church. She's also the great mother of the church as well. She's his mother and our mother. Is there a tradition that the image that was presented to King Abdul-Akbar was preserved? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You can read about it in chapter two of my book. <laughs> <laughs> I can send you a PDF if you don't want to. <laughs> yes, and, and in fact, it's prob there's a tradition that probably the Crusaders somehow got that tradition from the, 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 the right, exactly, and then it went farther west, eventually. It's very complicated. Uh, yes, sorry, please. Mm hmm. That's the main thing. That she's the the, the, the precious. It was the most precious, the most expensive garment that one could have in the ancient world. The color of royalty. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what is the literary influence of that from one? Say, this is David Oh, it's huge. It's very, very significant. Um, through Romanos the Syrian, who was a, who wrote Byzantine hymns, but he also was Syri Syriac speaking. So there was a large population that spoke both Greek and Syriac. And they're going to bring Ephraim into the Byzantine tradition. Um, although there was a little bit of a debate about that in the church, the Council of Trullo, um, because some people didn't think you should be singing non-biblical hymns in church. Um, so the Syrians have to sort of stand as a witness against why it's helpful. Of course, Mary sings in the Bible. It starts with the Magnificat, as we know. But So maybe it's, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for your attention.